technology and big data and how we use that, um, how useful is it, and whether we still do need a human um, as part of the process. So I'd just like to situate this talk um, a little bit. Um, emerging technologies or ET and big data obviously open up really exciting opportunities for the geomorphic analysis of river systems like never before. We can analyse things at different scales, at very fine scales, very coarse scales, over significant spatial scales, um, and we have massive data sets that we can utilise as part of the process. However, I feel that in the last uh, decade, as these things have sort of taken off and everybody has been getting on the bandwagon of using big data in geomorphic analysis of rivers, that we've sort of failed to provide a suitable conceptual framework with which uh, we can plug in these different tools and analyses um, into and integrate those with more traditional river surveys. And I think we've failed so far to also uh, provide a more community-based or consortium-based approach to the availability and the quality, um, and the quality, the quality of those different tools, and the types of outputs that are being produced from the use of those big data sets. However, um, as I'll talk about in a little moment, uh, that seems to be in the pipeline. So we're heading towards a more sharing uh, community whereby we can access and use the best available tools as part of this geomorphic analysis. Then the question is raised, well, how do we use that as part of our best river management practice? And I feel that river management in the absence of well-developed and scaffolded data sets is often very piecemeal, reactive and poorly integrated. And so developing these uh, consistent data sets, but also well-integrated data sets, and making them open access to anybody who wishes to use them in an applied context is really important. Just a note of caution, um, I'm not advocating here that we flip um, into a fully automated world. In fact, quite the opposite. I think we need to start considering um, where we're actually situated in the use of big data and technology and ensure that we don't get uh, swayed by uh, the use of the latest shiny toy and hoping that that will solve many of the issues that we face uh, in river management um, and the geomorphic analysis of rivers. So I always say don't let the technology drive the questions. I think um, globally in some parts of the world um, the latest shiny toy is driving the questions that we ask rather than actually sitting down and thinking what is the question, what is the problem that needs to be solved and then using the technology and the data to help us answer some of those questions of significance. So I always say that the first thought should be what is the question or the problem that you're trying to address, not what is the, piece of, the latest piece of technology or data that's available um, that we can use or play with. And I think we definitely need to ensure that we maintain our field-based analyses because these are the reality checks. This is where we verify where output from use of big data, technology, modelling, whatever the situation is, that's where we get the reality check on the ground. And so I think we need to find some middle ground. And so we've started thinking about this a little bit more broadly in terms of what is interpretation and, ex and explanation uh, in geomorphology? What are the skills that we need? And these are cognitive skills and they're also associated with training within our field. So we get really excited when we're in that middle ground where you get the light bulb moments and you get the fireworks when you're asking the right questions and trying to solve uh, problems of significance. And of course, that has to be informed by big data, using the latest technology, using the latest analyses um, that we have available to us. But I also think that we should maintain um, our field-based analyses and our capacity as humans to read the landscape. So I need to situate that um, in context. So what will it take to fully integrate ET into existing frameworks for geomorphic analysis and management of rivers? Well, it's gonna take humans. Um, hopefully we'll never be put out of a job uh, in terms of the skills that we have in terms of geomorphic analysis and use of geomorphology um, in the management. We need humans to carefully choose an existing framework to plug our emerging technologies into. 
We need to have the conceptual grounding and training to ask the right questions. We need to collect the right data, measure the right things at the right spatial and temporal scale. We need to carefully consider whether the current technology and the data is good enough, in inverted commas, for some of these analyses, or whether things will come online, or they will come online in the future that can help us to improve um, some of those analyses. So not all data is good data. To interrogate and interpret the output, so this is my reality check. Um, I don't believe that we can fully automate geomorphic analysis of rivers. Um, and we have to be very, very careful in the selection of the data that we use because garbage in um, equal, equals garbage out. And we also need humans to develop these tools um, and approaches to advance the geomorphic analysis of rivers. So what I've done here is, this is not a talk about uh, river styles per se, but we do get recurrent questions from many, many parts of the world saying, how much of this analysis of geomorphic analysis of rivers can actually be automated? And where do we currently scan um, in a global sense in terms of our understanding and the use of this technology and big data in the process? So today I just want to use um, this as a, as a bit of a case study just to provide some guidance on what tools are available, what emerging technology is available um, that can help us to enhance or expedite the process um, and still ask the question, do we still, where, where in the process do we still um, need a human with an emphatic um, yes. So just a reminder, um, River Styles has four stages and it's very similar to many other geomorphic frameworks that are out there um, in a global context. And so I'm just using this as a bit of a foundation to discuss the extent to which we can use some of these tools and techniques well, firstly, understanding what types of rivers we have to characterise or to classify them, to understand how they operate, so the processes and the behaviour uh, that's occurring for those different types of rivers, to understand how they've evolved in the past or how they've changed in the past and whether we can assess river health through analyses of some of these data sets. And then to consider the forecasting. So how might we consider um, how rivers may or may not adjust in the future and whether they have potential to improve their condition um, over decades or even longer. And then use of this information in, in a very practical management context. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a sense from my perspective of where I think we currently sit in terms of our capacity uh, to semi-automate or automate these sorts of analyses. So on the right hand side there you'll see I've come up with a bit of a a bit of a criteria for how much of these analyses I think uh, can be automated in the current situation that we find ourselves. So for character and behaviour, 60%, condition, yeah, a bit low, recovery potential, 30%, and I've put a big fat zero uh, next to the river management. But what we are considering uh, in terms of, of future analyses is what that is the power board that we're going to use. What is the conceptual framework that we're going to use to plug all these different tools into? And is that a useful exercise? And what is the output? What is the, what is the output that can be generated um, by using these different techniques and tools? And then, do we still need a human to do some of the interpretation and explanation that I was talking about, that middle ground area? So what we've done, um, just to have sort of prov provoke a little bit of reaction um, in the community, is to consider some of these analyses as a power board. And we had a bit of an attempt for our stage one section of river style, which is just the identification of different river types, their character and their behaviour, uh, to consider how much of this can be automated. And so on the top left hand side there, you don't need to look at the detail is the procedural tree. These are the, the measures, the techniques, uh, the interpretations that we undertake to identify different types of river and to classify those different types of river. And what we did in the bottom uh, right, on, the, on the, the bottom right hand side, is to translate this into a power board. So what we've done here is we've put our little power sockets and we've actually looked around uh, the place and said, okay, can, what tool is available to us um, to 
automate or semi-automate these different analyses. And we've coded those according to whether the tool or the workflow is actually available now in 2020, whether the data and the technology is available, but the tool is not yet available, or whether we still need the human. We still need to undertake field work and we still need to undertake an expert manual approach. And you can see that certain parts of these analyses can be automated, certainly at coarser scales. So at the value setting scale, we can use um, DEMs and so on to help us uh, differentiate uh, different types of value settings in the landscape. But you can see that there's still a significant amount of green and blue um, in our power board. So we're getting there. We can do some of these analyses, uh, but we certainly need uh, better tool development, more tool development, um, and I don't think we'll ever get rid of any of the green uh, on the power board. Just quickly, just to show you some of the outputs or some of the types of things that, that can be done uh, as part of this characterization of rivers, this first step. I've put on the left-hand side there some available tools that already exist and some pretty pictures on the right-hand right side of some of the outputs that are possible from using some of these tools that we plug into our power board. And so you can see that there is availability of things like valley confinement tools, there's geomorphic unit tools or guts uh, that can be used to map different types of landforms, certainly the shapes of those different types of landforms. Um, and we also have sophisticated analyses for looking at grain size or bed material texture for some types of rivers, certainly for gravel bed river systems. However, the qualifier on this is that we can produce these data sets, but the interpretation of what's actually on those maps still takes a human. So the one on the bottom right there, gut, is an example from Joe Wheaton, whereby he's developed the geomorphic unit tool for mapping different types of landforms. And what that tool does is it produces the maps based on the shape of these different features that we see within the riverscape. However, the tool does not tell you what landform that is. It doesn't tell you whether it's a pool or a riffle. It just tells you whether it's a concave surface or a convex surface. And so to put that interpretation layer on top um, still requires a geomorphologist with enough training to understand what those different types of features are along those rivers. So we're, we're quite a ways ahead. Um, it's certainly in terms of characterising the geomorphology of different types of rivers. And there's some really exciting work um, happening in that space. The next step, step is thinking about, well, what does that mean in terms of behaviour and process? And so we do have some very sophisticated tools coming online. Many of you will be um, intimately familiar with the uh, geomorphic uh, change detection toolkits. But again, um, it requires an analysis of or an interpret interpretation of those processes. Quickly turning to having a look at condition, when we're looking at condition, we need to be measuring different geoindicators that give us a reliable and a relevant signal about the condition of our streams. Do I think we can do this yet? I think we can a little bit, but I think that this still takes a significant amount of human effort and certainly a significant amount of our field work for us to fully uh, get at the health or the condition of our river systems. And so we do have course available data, set, data sets available that can help us, but it still requires a significant amount of human effort to get to this sort of level of information. When we're talking about forecasting, um, when we talk about forecasting, we're trying to assess whether we're going to see an improvement in river condition um, over time. So what is the recovery potential of rivers and how much of this can be automated in the current situation? We do have um, some analyses or some data sets and techno technology that allows us to consider whereabouts in the landscape uh, we might see geomorphic adjustments. And we can start to run some of the models like Zach was talking about earlier to help us to get at whether we expect to see geomorphic change over different time frames and under the influence of different types of disturbances or controlling factors. In terms of modelling things like sediment flux and where in the landscape change may well be manifest, there's a whole range of different tools that are available out there 
things, everything from the Zuba hotspots toolkit through to Cascade, through to the buffers and barriers work that we've been looking at to try and help us understand whereabouts in the landscape uh, rivers may change in the context of changing sediment flux and what some of those uh, implications may be. I don't think we're very good yet at actually doing the forecasting in a similar way to uh, what Zach was talking about. I think we're quite terrible uh, globally in terms of actually tackling some of those um, analyses in a more sophisticated way. So finally, um, in terms of management, well, I'm hopeful that we'll never replace a human uh, in doing river management and doing river management on the ground. There may well be the occasional um, area where we can automate, certainly in terms of uh, prioritisation. If we have those background data sets, we can run decision trees and decision support systems that help to map the distribution uh, or different priority areas. But again, I would consider that to also require a significant human element and certainly needs verification um, on the ground. Although there are startups out there, I understand, I don't know if anyone's used any of this, uh, where drones are planting trees um, and also who knows where AI is going to go into the future and whether that will replace uh, some of these high level decision making processes. Um, we shall see. Just a note very, very quickly, and I'm running out of time, um, about training and professional development. So in my time of reflecting on where we're at, I think we're, we're, we're quite well positioned uh, globally in the use of, of technology and these big data sets. Um, however, I, I fear for the level of training um, that's being uh, delivered and also the level of, of quality that's being produced in terms of uh, geomorphic analysis of, of rivers that's a, that's a consequence um, of the use of that technology. I don't mean to be cynical. Um, so I think it's still critically important that we have suitably trained and qualified uh, geomorphologists, certainly to make decisions about the types of tools that are being used, the quality of the data that's being used, and also interpretation of the output. And so I think it's really important that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so we need to have much stronger collaboration, possibly in a consortium based environment for field trained geomorphologists to work very closely with ET trained uh, geomorphologists so that we can uh, push the field forward and use the best available information in a management context. So do we still need a human? Absolutely. Uh, to choose the right tool for the job, we may need to consider using traditional methods if the uh, ET is not yet good enough or the tools are not yet well enough developed or the output is terrible. And we need to interrogate and verify that ET data in the field. That's incredibly important because that's the reality check. And we need to be able to make resourcing and rehabilitation decisions and to do the on ground river management itself. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Apologies, I've taken up my full 20 minutes, but I understand we're heading into morning tea.